All right. Listen, everybody say the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Discovering the key to intimately knowing God, knowing the Father. How many of you noticed a common thread tonight between our Torah portion and our half Torah portion and even the Brit Hadashah portion, if you had ears to hear? And you're like, well, people kept dropping dead. <laughs> I mean, in the Torah portion, you've got two guys that decide they were going to do God's thing, but they were going to do it their way. And how many of you know it didn't turn out so good for the cousins, did it? Matter of fact, it said Aaron kept silent. Remember that? Why do you think that was? That, listen, that was his nephews. They were a close-knit family. But what's he going to do? How can you defend that? He couldn't. So he decided it was best for him to just keep his mouth shut. How many of you know sometimes it's best just to zip it? <laughs> Amen? And sometimes, most of the time, when we're silent, that's when you'll begin to hear the whisper of God in your ear. Amen? That's another story for another day. So we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. And I actually want to take our half Torah portion that we read tonight, and I'm going to go back through it with you, and we're going to talk about it. So in the first part, in the Torah portion, we had two guys decide to do God's thing their own way, and what happened to them? They were like Kentucky Fried Chicken. They got burned up to a crispy critter. Okay? Literally, the fire of God hit them. I mean, really, it's, it's, that's what happened. The fire of God came and consumed them, it said. And then what happened after our portion? They've got the Ark of the Covenant on this oxen cart, and the thing's fixing to tip over, and Uzzah, he just decides, I'm going to help out. And he puts his hand on the Ark to keep it from tumping. Boom! Consumed by God. Dies. And King David was angry at God at first. He feared the Lord. He was a little upset with God because God struck Uzzah. I want to talk to you about why that happened. Okay? There's a lot more of that story that meets the eye. How many of you know there normally is in the Word of God? Amen? How many of you have ever peeled an onion? How many of you know when you peel one layer from an onion, what's under it? When you peel that other layer, what's under it? When you peel that layer, what's under it? I mean, you just peel, 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 peel until you're at that little, 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 itty-bitty centerpiece, okay? And that's actually the best tasting part of the onion. That's another story, too, for another day. But the Word of God is like this onion that we just have to peel it away to get at the core, amen? So, let's pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we do thank you for the good word of the Lord. Father, I pray tonight that you speak through me into each of these, your people. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you empower me by your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that you minister the words of life to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see what you are speaking to encourage their life tonight. In the name of Yeshua, and everyone said... Amen and amen. David and the whole house of Israel celebrated in the presence of Adonai with all kinds of musical instruments made of cypress wood, including lyres, lutes, tambourines, rattles, and cymbals. Sounds like a pretty darn good praise band, doesn't it? I mean, at this point, listen to me, at this point there was 30,000. Everybody say 30,000. 30,000 young men that David called to come get the ark, okay? And they went to get the ark, and they've got musical instruments, and man, they're just ready to have a praise celebration. Except we've got some major problems, okay? What was the problem with Aaron's nephews? They tried to do a holy thing their own way instead of God's way. And you're going to find out that's exactly, exactly, exactly what happened here. Now, let me give you some background. The Ark of the Covenant, I want to show you a picture of it real quick. This is what the Ark of the Covenant looked like, okay? Give or take, but this is a pretty good replication of it or replica of it, okay? And it's a chest, and that's a lid on top with two cherubim, okay, whose angels, uh, whose wings nearly touched. And that's two poles on both sides. Guess what the poles were for? They're for carrying the ark. 
Matter of fact, God gave specific instructions as to how the ark was to travel. Specific. Everybody say specific. 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 And so what had happened is before this, Israel had taken the ark um, during the time of the judges, and they were in rebellion against God, and they thought if we could just bring the ark of God to the battlefield, maybe we'll win. Well, the ark of God was captured by the Philistines and was brought and taken to this village, and in this village they put it in this museum in the temple of their god Dagon. Dagon was a fish god. Well, there is no fish god, but they thought there was. And so they had this giant statue of this fish with legs and arms. Well, when they came in the next morning, the fish god was tumped over, and its head was removed, and its hands were removed. So they sat back upright and thought that was weird. The next morning they come back, and again, the fish god's tumped over before the Ark of the Covenant, its head removed, and its hands removed. Well, then they still weren't getting the message that God wanted the ark to go back to Israel. So then the scripture tells us that tumors began to break out on the people's bodies. And the village became infested with rats. What a nasty combination. Some translations actually say rats with tumors. But it was tumors and rats that were infesting this village. And so they thought, it must be the God of Israel. He's upset with us because we have the Ark of the Covenant. So they said, what we're going to do is take it, put it on an ox cart, and put two oxen on it that have never been tied up. And if it goes into the nation of Israel, we'll know that this was God's doing. If not, then we'll know it was just coincidence. Coincidence. How many of you know there is no coincidence? This Bible says in Proverbs, the dice is rolled, the lot is cast, but the final decision is up to who? Up to God. Everybody say up to God. Up to God. Up to God. So this is what happens. So the Ark of the Covenant and the two oxen, they start lowing, however oxen do. And off they went. They made a beeline. They didn't look left or right. The scripture says they made a beeline straight for the border of Israel. And the princes and the kings of the Philistines, they followed and they're just watching because they're in the Shephela, this valley between the coast and the mountains. And you can see for miles. So they're just watching this ox cart go straight off. And it goes into the border and the Israelites take it and it stops at a stone. Standing stone. It stops at a stone and that stone became a stone of remembrance. A place where they remember it's where the ark came back. So they took the ark and it stayed in this guy's house on his threshing floor for actually like years and years and years. Well, make a long story short, now David's the king and he decides, hey, why am I letting God bless this guy? Because wherever the ark is, there's a blessing of God on it because it's the presence of God. Why am I going to let this guy be blessed when I could take the ark to my palace? So he decides he's going to go get the ark. So he sends these guys out. But it sounds good. He's got singers and praisers and worshipers and dancers. The only problem is they were going to do it their way instead of God's way. And how many of you know there's God's way and there's the wrong way? <laughs> Amen. God's way. Everybody say God's way. And the wrong way. Now the world hates that. I get it. But I'm just telling you. So let's find out as who is that guy who used to be on the radio would say. And now for the rest of the story. Verse 6, when they arrived at, the, uh, at Nacon's threshing floor, that's where the ark was, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah put out his hand to study the ark of God. But Adonai's anger blazed up against Uzzah. How many of you know whenever God's anger blazes up against you, it's not a good thing? Amen. Blazed up against Uzzah and God struck him down on the spot for his offense so that he died there by the ark of God. It upset David that Adonai had broken out against Uzzah. It upset him that the guy, in his mind at first, he's thinking, hey, it's like somebody reading the story that doesn't peel the layers. They're like, hey, what's the deal? The guy was just trying to help steady the ark. He didn't do anything wrong. You see, we're thinking like humans. And so David's a little upset with God. And verse 9, David was frightened of Adonai that day, and he asked, how can the ark of Adonai come to me? It's like, I want it 
to come to Jerusalem, where it belongs. But how am I going to get it there if everybody keeps dying? And actually, there was a case where 70 other people died from mishandling the ark, by the way, in the scripture. It's for another day and another story. Why did the Lord strike down Uzzah? So there's two oxen, there's a cart, there's the Ark of the Covenant, praisers, singers, everything's looking good. The Ark starts to tumble a little bit. Uzzah sticks his hand out, touches it to steady it. Why did he strike down Uzzah? Only the Levites could move the Ark, number one. Why? Because that's the way God set it up. Only the priest could touch the Ark of the Covenant. And they couldn't even touch the Ark. They could only touch the poles. Everybody say poles. Did you know even Moses and Aaron could not touch the ark? Nobody could touch the ark. That's why it had poles going through the loops. And only the Levites could move the ark with the poles. And it had to carry it on their shoulders. Okay? And so there was this way that God had designed because the ark represented his very presence. His very presence. Amen? The Spirit of God dwelt literally, physically on the ark. You could see like this light illuminating from the ark. It was the ark of the covenant where God's presence formed the cloud by day and the fire by night. That came from the very top of the lid of the ark over all the camp of Israel. Are you following me? So it was the, the literally holiest thing as far as a physical element on this earth to symbolize the presence of God. It was so holy, what was in the Holy of Holies? One thing was in the Holy of Holies. What was it? The Ark of the Covenant. So inside of this chest, what was in it? Y'all remember, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and an ofa of manna. Okay? An ofa of manna. No one could ever touch the Ark. If you touched it, you died. Ordinance, disposal analogy. All right, this is to remind me. Let me give you an example. Let's say, how many of you here have ever served in the military? Anybody? Wow. Okay, what branch? Air Force. Air Force. All right. Well, let's say that you're in the part of the military that deals with bomb disposal, okay, or the disposal of ordinance. And let's say that I'm your commanding officer, and I tell you, whatever you do, don't touch this device. If you touch it, it's going to destroy you. We have a special way of handling it, a special machine to handle it. Now, if she reaches out to touch it to steady that device after being told, is that her instructor's fault or her fault? Her fault if she blows up. Uzzah touched the ark. He knew not to touch it. How did he know? Remember I told you that the Ark of the Covenant came back to the borderlands of Israel and stayed at this guy's house and threshing floor for years and years and years? It was Uzzah's dad. It was his dad. That's who had the Ark. He became, literally, he was the son of Abinadab. And the Ark was at the house and home of Abinadab. He was his son. He grew up with this thing. But it became too commonplace for him. How many of you know that he was overly familiar with the ark? There's a saying out that familiarity breeds contempt. You become over familiar with something holy and it begins to breed contempt. And you don't reverence the things of God like you should reverence them. You don't respect the positions or the anointings or the callings of God on people's lives like you should respect them. And that's just a bad place to be. He was in a hurry. David, I actually put all the responsibility of this whole story on King David. Because guess what? David knew there was a right way to move the ark and a wrong way. But David was in a rush. Have you ever gotten in a hurry in your life or in a rush in your life and because you got in a hurry, you ended up messing things up? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> Listen, David was in a hurry. He was ready for the ark to come back to Jerusalem. He wanted to be blessed. He wanted God's blessings on his life instead of a Bandab's household. And he got in so big of a hurry that he decided he was going to move the ark his way 
instead of moving the ark God's way. Well, after this happened, how many of you know, he decided, okay, maybe I need to do it God's way. And so then he had the priests come and they lifted on their shoulders. They went six paces. They sacrificed animals. He danced before God. That's where he began to dance before the Lord. You know that song, I will dance like that. That's where he began to dance before God. I mean, he decided, okay, I better do this his way this time so nobody else dies. Okay, And so the fear of the Lord, guys, literally, you read it time and time again in Scripture, and it literally means reverence for God. Everyone say reverence for God. And remember, the Ark of the Covenant, where was it at? They had it on an ox cart. Was it supposed to be on an ox cart? Everybody say no. It was supposed to be carried not by an ox cart, but by who? By the priest. I mean, this is a holy thing, and they're treating it so irreverently, they put it on an old ox cart. And this is the very presence of God. You see how dangerous that is? Where we take God's presence. And that's why I love, be, I love our Friday night service because I think it, it puts and reinstills in our heart a spirit of holiness, a spirit of reverence for God and for the things of God and for the things that God says that are holy to Him. Amen. They were holy and they're still holy. Amen. Now, look at this, and this is a, another little story right here, and I've got just enough time to go through this. Samuel answered, even though you consider yourself... Now, Samuel is a prophet of God. He's speaking to King Saul, who's the first king over Israel after the judges. And God had told Saul to do something very specific. And Saul, like we did and do at times, decided, I'm going to do what God said, but I'm going to do it my way. Wasn't that Barbara Streisand? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. How'd that go? He's, I did it my way. I did it my way. And that's like the most reprobate song on the planet. I did it my way. And that was like Saul's song to God. Except he's like, well, I'm doing God. God, I'm doing your will, but I'm doing it my way. You don't mind, do you? And that was Saul's whole life. But let's look at this. So in verse 17, Samuel the prophet answered, and he's talking to Saul, the king. He says, even though you consider, consider yourself of no importance, you are the leader of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you, Saul, king of Israel. And he sent you out with orders to destroy those wicked people of Amalek. He told you to fight until you had killed them all. Everyone say all. Why then did you not obey him? Why did you rush to grab the loot and so do what displeased the Lord? Elsewhere, Saul says, well, you know, I did exactly what God said. And Samuel's like, well, what's the bleeding of sheep I hear <laughs> off in the distance if you were supposed to kill everything? Now look at this. In verse 20, I did obey the Lord, Saul replied. I went as he told me to, and I brought back King Agag. But I killed all the rest of the Amalekites. But my men did not kill the best sheep and cattle that they captured. Instead, they brought them here to Gilgal to offer as a sacrifice to the Lord your God. So you know, God, we're not going to do it your way that you instructed us, but we're going to add our own religious twist to it. Instead of doing what you said, we're just going to bring him back and we're going to offer him as a religious sacrifice to you, God, to make you happy. And what does Samuel say in verse 22? And this is so important. If you ever highlight or underline or memorize anything, memorize this. Samuel the prophet said, which does the Lord prefer, obedience or offerings and sacrifices? It is better to obey him than to sacrifice the best sheep to him. And today I feel like oftentimes in my life, in your life, often we're sacrificing the best sheep and we're short on obedience. Short on obedience. Amen or oh me. Verse 23, Samuel goes on and oh, this one just guts you. Rebellion against him, against God, is as bad as witchcraft. And arrogance, how many of you know that all sin has its root in pride, but when we say we're going to serve God our way, that's arrogance. That's the ultimate of pride. And arrogance is as sinful as idolatry. Because you rejected the Lord's command, he has rejected you as what? King. And that was the day that Saul lost his kingdom. And because he didn't kill Agag, the last Amalekite, 
guess what happened? King Agag went on, the Amalekites reproduced, and guess who was his descendant? Haman. Remember the Purim story? Remember the dude who wanted to kill all the Jews in Persia? He was a descendant of Amalek. It says actually in Scripture, in the book of Esther, a descendant of Agag. Literally. How amazing is that? So God has reasons and purposes. We don't see his reasons and purposes, but he always has them. Amen? Now, let's go on. The fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Everybody say the beginning. The beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? Is that this trembling, oh, God's got a baseball bat, he's going to knock me upside the head? No, that is not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is reverence. Everybody say reverence. Reverence, reverence for God and for the holy things of God. Amen? Just reverence. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of knowledge. That's where it all starts. If you don't have reverence for the Lord and for the things of God, and I'll be honest with you, the body of Messiah in America scares me to death. We have no reverence for anything. I mean, we just, I don't know, we're just foot free and God doesn't care. We think God doesn't care about anything anymore. It's like God used to care, but now under Yeshua and the Brit Hadashah and the New Covenant, God doesn't care about anything anymore. And I'm telling you, that is not what the Scripture teaches. Matter of fact, he cares more. Amen? He cares more. <laughs> Proverbs 1, 28 and 29. It says, Then they will call upon me, but I will not what? Will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not what? Find me. Why? Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the what? They had no reverence for God. They're calling on him, but he's not answering. Why? Because they lost their reverence for God. And this happened with the Jews, guys. They had their religious tradition ceremony down. The sacrifice is down. Twice a day, boom. Nine o'clock, three o'clock. Nine o'clock, three o'clock. Nine o'clock, three o'clock. But then their hearts had turned from God. They no longer reverenced God and no longer obeyed him. And they still had the religious tradition. They still had the religious thing going on. Nothing ever takes place for reverence in God in our heart and the things of God. Amen? Almost done. Hang in there. I'm right on time. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord. Everybody say fear of the Lord. Fear of the, Lord. the reverence of God, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. How many of you want to live a long life? I was sharing with a friend of mine the other day. They discovered this, well, they didn't discover, but there's a village in Italy Along the Mediterranean, there's a population of just over 2,000. And of those 2,000 people, over 200 of them are over the age of 100. And they want to know why. And to make a long story short, they eat the same thing everybody else eats in Italy, except for one thing. They eat a lot of rosemary in their diet. So they're studying this village to try to determine what is the deal to live a long life. Scripture says you want to live a long life, have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord does what to life? prolongs it, but the years of the wicked will be short. Proverbs 14, 26, In the fear of the Lord, everybody say fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. One has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. How many of you have children? How many of you want your children to have a refuge in God, even if they don't know Him at this moment? Amen? The fear of the Lord, you can have strong confidence in God. And your children will find a refuge in him. I think of a refuge, you know what I think of? I think of this sheltering, loving daddy's arms. Amen. Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the what? Fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. You know, as a new believer in Yeshua, one of the very first things I learned to study out was the fear of the Lord. There's hundreds of verses, hundreds, literally. Okay? So it's better to have a little bit with a reverence for God than to have great storehouses full of money or bank accounts full of money and trouble with it. And we see that. Look at the lives of the Hollywood elite and the celebrities. They've got money. They've got fame. But their homes and lives and everything is just a disaster, right? They're hungry. They don't know what's missing. And you say, well, that's the old 
Testament, or the Tanakh, way back in the Brit Hadashah, New Testament. Acts 9.31, So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up in the Holy Spirit, walking in the what? Fear of the Lord. Everybody say, fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. And in the comfort of what? The Holy Spirit. It multiplied. So it didn't just have, you see, a lot of people have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Congregations have the comfort of the Holy Spirit, but there's very little fear of the Lord. There's very little reverence for the holy things of God. We need to allow a reverent spirit in our hearts and lives to come back for the things of God and for God himself. Not just for his stuff, but for him. Amen. For him. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet.